So the important question is, what does say say? The, the, what, what he actually says is, is a very complex, seems to be very complex. As I said, it's, it's for slow reading. And there are different interpretations of it. If you look at the uh, different authors interpreting, say, they would have a different uh, understanding. Let's try to, uh, to narrow it down. There are three cornerstones. Or you may say, four, four cornerstones, open society, open economy would be one of them. But the three really important cornerstones are, it's a barter economy. A barter economy in the strict sense is an economy where exchange of products happens. So it's one product exchanged against another product. I said before, there is an important role here now for money. So in strict sense, so a money economy, money exchange is not a barter economy. But in his understanding, money is only a means for circulation, for immediate circulation. So money itself is a product of exchange. It's not for storage, it's not for the valuation, but it is there only as a means, as fuel, if you want, to, for exchange. But the economy, complete, and that means also instantaneous flexibility of prices. It happens here and now that the price changes. It's not a long term where well, we don't know how the price of oil, of cars, of jackets is in four months, in four years. It's now, happening now. Third cornerstone, no intervention. It's free trade. It's this immediate bartering and there is no intervention from whichever side that is interfering in this direct exchange. What you basically can say immediately is this is a very, very simple model. If you compare it with our economies today, we have a central bank that decides about the interest rate which influences the prices and all this what you know from the newspaper, and probably don't understand. I usually don't understand it. If I understand it, I don't know why they do it. Uh, but anyway, this is a complex economic system where you have permanent intervention. Prices don't change immediately. It's, it's, it's not this, this immediate change that you go to the shop and next day you get the car or you get the computer for... 200 euro, 2,000 euro, 20,000 euro less. It's not this what happens. This is the idea of, say, demand, supply are in an equilibrium. We talked about this term. And it is actually the supply that determines the demand. Now we come to what I said our way as economists to make things easy. To make things easy means the one point or the core point we have to put a figure in. Then we can calculate it, then we know what productivity is, we know what wealth is, we know uh, what efficiency is, if we put a figure on it. And one of the key figures in economics 
is the GDP. It's one of the key figures, if not the key figure, to measure performance of an economy. And at the same time, it is one of the most problematic figures we have. We said we are thinking about the production and reproduction of daily, <coughs> of, of daily life, of people. So what do we measure? We think we measure, the best way to measure this is how much resources, what are the resources you have to live. But this is too simple. It's actually too complicated for us because we cannot simply measure the income and then we, we know. We are looking at the overall economy and then we say <coughs> economies are producing goods and they are producing goods on an increasing level but in a very complex system. Now I skip the one. Art. What to include this? Mind. This is one of the problems we face. We still have subsistence production. You, you cook your, you prepare your own meal in the dormitory occasionally. Occasionally you go to the canteen. Different things. In economic terms, it's different things. If you do it even with your own vegetables, you grow in some plant around the corner, you have your own vegetable, you chase the rabbit, get it, put it into the, uh, into the pot, there's subsistence. The canteen is not. Now, what happens is production takes place in a differentiated society. We are producing, that's uh, another way of saying it, we are producing different things. And it's in different sectors of societies, and there are different ways of, of saying this, of, of approaching it. There are different departments. You don't have to know this in detail, but you have to be aware of it. Production of means of Production. We produce machines, we produce computers to produce something else. We produce something which is used to produce something else. Then we produce, that's a different area of the economy, a different section, a different department, which we produce consumables. The vegetables, the jackets, the trousers, the shoes, the computer, if we use it just to have fun. If we do not produce it or if we, we do not use it in our company as a means of production. And then you have a, a, a third department that is finance, finances, financial services. There you see a derivation from Say. Say says money is there only as a means for circulation. Get it and spend it. Here we have a new sector, a new department that says money has its own value. And you can make business with it. You hoard it, you have it in the bank, you invest it in financial services. <coughs> Finances and um, insurances would be the typical areas here. And department four is what I call independent services as healthcare, 
is education. This is a new kind of new sector or area of economic activities. As I said, you don't have to remember it in, in details, but you should be aware of it, that we have production in different areas. It's not about the use value we are talking, but it's about the exchange value. It's about producing for different markets. And then there is something actually you, you should keep in mind, that's a very, very standard thing, especially when it comes to performances of economies. We have three sectors, and the easiest way to talk about three sectors is about the primary, secondary, and tertiary, tertiary sector, which means primary sector is about raw materials, including farming. So it's this immediate interaction, production with and from nature. The secondary sector is, if you want, the, production, the industrial production, the production of goods or commodities. It can happen in the small manufacturing, the small workshop, or it can happen in a large enterprise with 10,000 or more employees. The tertiary sector is supplying of services to consumers and businesses, which would be banking, which would be childcare, which would be uh, education, it would be the shop who provides the service of selling stuff to you. Now, there is a discussion about extending this and saying there is a quaternary and quaternary sector intellectual activities. Um, <clears throat> whatever it is, I'm, I'm providing a service at the same time writing my books is probably something there in the Quarterly sector, and then you will have plenary uh, sector, high level decision making, occasionally also domestic activities. Um, I only mentioned this A to be complete and B to, to make you aware of it is not as simple as that that you once have it and, and forever <coughs> in the world. There are always leeways to, uh, to look at the different ways. It is important to keep this in mind, especially when we continue to think about economies as, as a circular process of equity, welfare production, and efficiency. There is a framework for it within which we do it, the different departments, the different sectors. And of course they have to be in one way or another equally developed. Or there must be mechanisms to equalize what happens in different sectors. So you cannot <coughs> produce means of production permanently without actually using them to produce consumables. You cannot produce consumables, provide services, if you do not have any agricultural products. Because this is usually what we eat. It includes fish farming and so on. So I took this from a, uh, some material of uh, Krupman. Uh, with these different sectors, with these different 
uh, activities, we have different actors. We talked about this. We have different households. The very simple is the private household, the business household, the enterprise exchanging. The one provides labor, the one produces and provides the products. Remember this very simple circle. With what we have had before, sectors and departments, having an open economy, meaning an international trade as well, we can go further and say it's not only the household and the firm, the private household and the business that produces something, But we have other institutions, other actors as well. We have the factory markets, providing labor, providing machines, where you see that's another one. I produce a consumer, for instance, but I buy a machine to produce it. I buy raw material to produce it, factors of production all coming up again. Markets for goods and services. We buy the service from the bank, financial institution. We buy the service of the accountant doing our books because we don't want to do it ourselves. We buy the service of an internet provider because we use internet in our company, in the firm, to produce, to have our fancy website uh, to advertise our, our, our products. <coughs> then we have the government being a consumer, building roads, is consumptions of our pro consumption of our product in a way. We build for the government because nobody of you will probably buy a road but the government says, we buy it for you. Nobody will buy a school, but the government says, we will provide a school that you can go there. We will provide a hospital that you can go there. And that's, of course, then on the international, on the global market, the rest of the world. <clears throat> this is the economic dimension and there is of course then the question coming back to this more general question there are many things that are not really going into this calculation we have had before we have health services but we are not looking at the health status we may have an excellent health service but people are still sick The environmental quality. What is happening if we are producing? There's always some pollution taking place. Even if I speak, I pollute the air. So different things could be included, should be included, but that's not what we are doing now. And of course, there is always, as well, when I said it's, it's the government, it's the private enterprise, it's always coming back to this, uh, what uh, Eleanor Ostrom mentioned, the different resources, public, private, uh, common pool resources, and toilets. That's only a kind of side remark we have to keep in mind. But we really have to keep in mind when we discuss then the technicalities. The magic figure, GDP, gross domestic product. And we are all happy when it grows because that means the economy is blooming and developing. And I wouldn't say that makes us happy, 
But as economists, we think it makes us happy. It is an aggregate figure. So we usually say, in very broad terms, it is what we produce and what we all produce, meaning we all, all enterprises, at a given point of time, important, it's not China since its beginning, but it's China in 2016. 2015. You may say we are interested in the GDP 2010 to uh, 2000 to 2010, but it's always bringing things together an aggregate figure. It's not looking at the individuals, but putting it together, meaning you have a pile of goods. This is kind of visible, you can easily grasp what it is. There are shoe, no, two, chair, a rucksack, and a little train, or this. It's a little bit more difficult if you go to this one. You don't really know what is in the boxes, but this is actually the more interesting for us as economists. We are not looking at what it really is, we are looking at the aggregate figure. Basically, how many boxes are there? And what is the value? <coughs> there is one important word in this definition. The final goods. If we produce something, Let's take it in China in 2016, and we are looking at the GDP in China 2016. If we produce something, and somebody else uses it to produce something else, it's not going into the GDP. It's not a final product. The final product is the chair on which you sit. <coughs> And then, of course, you will have difficulties. We'll come back to this later. So, interesting question. How many apples and bananas fit into a shoe? Aggregate figure means we have to think about some general expression of the value. And this is from the textbook, actually, page 40, 440. Suppose, though, that we know that the apples sell for uh, 0.25 euro each, bananas for 0.50 each, and shoes for 20 euro a pair each. Then the market value of this economy, economic, economy's production or its GDP is something we can calculate. If we have only bananas and apples, they say, we can say, OK, we have so many pieces of fruit. But shoes are not fruit. So we have to look for another reference. In math, we are talking about the common basically the common minimum common denominator, which is the money that we can use to express it, the money value that we can use to express it. So we know the price of each product. And apples, bananas, and shoes, and cars, and I don't know what, have one thing in common. If 
for us. It's not that you can eat them all, because you can't. It's not that you can wear them if you are walking, but it is the price. And then we can simply calculate how many apples, how many bananas, how many pairs of shoes, look at the price of the individual product, multiply it by the number of products, and get the overall value. So that is kind of simple. And then we can say there's always the production of a disequilibrium. Meaning when we are producing, we are producing at the same time externalities. And I know you all like these things. little figures and graphs. Um, what Pijou, I mentioned them before, uh, said, actually, if we produce something, we always produce as well an externality, meaning somebody has to pay for negative outcomes of our production. And then he said, as we are interested in a society, we have to find a mechanism of compensation. We We find as mechanism of compensation what is now called Pijovian tax, meaning you have to pay for the negativities you produced. The, the really simple way of making it understandable is environmental hazards. If you produce something and there's a negative effect on the environment, you should pay for the negative effect because we have to repair it. And we then means we as society. This is an important point, uh, and this is very kind of simple to calculate. Look at the margin cost in different areas, on the level of the enterprise and on the level of society. You calculate it, and you have the, 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 the amount that has to be paid to compensate for the negativities. <clears throat> then look at the uh, more or less funny side of it. It is, of course, a problem to compare GDP across different countries. <coughs> now, if you say China has a GDP of, just throw out a number uh, of 500, and Hungary has a GDP production of 50. Then, of course, the GDP 
is higher, the, the output of the economy is higher in China, right? Now, one of the problems is that Shangsha has nine million people living here, and Hungary as country has nine million people living there. I don't know how many people live in China, but if they produce 500, then if we calculate it per head, it is probably less than the 50 produced in Hungary per head. So we always have to, to relate it to how many people are actually producing this. And then, of course, China is still higher, but it's not because China is larger, but because the productivity is higher. Productivity in terms of the final product. This is another problem with the GDP. Keep in mind, it is the final product. What is if we have final products and we export them? What is if we compare different countries with the different exchange rates? So there are many problems even in the calculations. And I only want to go into one because it's, I think, somewhat funny. At least the idea behind it, it was The Economist, the journal who, who came up with it. And they said, actually, I forgot the name, I have it here. It's the Big Mac Index. The Big Mac Index. Mm. There is McDonald's. McDonald's is one, probably one of the most global enterprises producing something for daily life, meaning people eat their Big Macs. I don't know the market share or something. But they said, actually, the economists said, we can calculate a Big Mac index. What is the price of a Big Mac in different countries? And actually, we do not look simply at this, the price of the Big Mac, but we have a common uh, valuation and basically say how, may, how much, how many Big Macs or how much of a Big Mac can people consume in the different countries. So you can have different calculations and play around with the data. I think actually the raw material are on the internet and you can make your own calculations if you want. Um, and then we come in January 2016 to this stunning picture and you see the value, the international value of a Big Mac is actually quite different. The really important point of it is if we calculate GDP, we have to be very careful in terms of what are we actually calculating and what can we do with it. Can we calculate the raw figure? Can we link it to per capita, per, per head production, and how can we compare it internationally? The what goes in question is pretty straightforward. It's the final product. And it's, of course, if we do not compare it as an overall figure, it's, it's a simple figure without any dispute. But as soon as we say actually the GDP in country A is very high and in country B it is very low, does it say anything about the living standard? 
Let's try to, to build an extreme example. In country A, you have a GDP of 1,000. Figures don't matter. And in country B, you have a GDP of 1,000. In country A, person 1 owns 999 and N, the rest of the population, owns 1. And here you have actually 1,000 people and 1 to N has, everybody has one. What does it mean in terms of wealth? Here it's extremely unequal. Here it's extremely equal. Now you can go on and say, actually, in this country, country A, it's 10,000. And here it is still 1,000. If you do not calculate in absolute figures, but in percent, you would have 99% here versus 1% here. Which means actually turning it around, 1% has owns everything, kind of everything, whereas the 99% don't get anything. They get a very, very small amount. So you would have a difference there in terms of the meaning of what, it is, uh, what, what the GDP says. Now let's look a little bit at the technicalities. Because this is something you will have to know before you or when you are actually uh, thinking about the others. So a steel company sells some of its products to a car manufacturer, that means steel, and this is sold for 1,000 units. 1,000 yuan, 1,000 dollars, 1,000 what's it? The car manufacturer uses the purchase to produce cars which sell for 2,000 units. 2,000 yuan. To how much does its contribution to the GDP amount? Let's go through a couple of answers. <clears throat> Thousand. Okay? Because the steel company sells the products to the car, steel to the car manufacturer, and this is 1,000 units. Could be. That's what, what they say. Question is then, what is with the other 2,000 of selling the cars? 3,000. Because the steel company sells steel and the car manufacturer sells the cars. This is always the problem. We don't know really the profit of the car manufacturer. So we have to think about, be flexible, and say it's between 2,000 and 3,000. Because they may sell the car for different prices. D'accordo? Now the magic thing comes 2,000. 
because only 2000 is indeed the final product. The rest is important in some way because it happens, there is something produced, there is something going on on the market, there is exchange. And indeed we do not know exactly what is the profit made. But relevant is only the final product and this is the car. Now there is one problem, because life would be boring without problems. We consider that all cars are final products and not used for further production. If there is a sexy enterprise buying half of these cars, we are in trouble. Then it's only thousand. It's a final product means what is used for final consumption. If it is used for another business, it won't go into the GDP. Now there is another magic figure we have to keep in mind, and that is the GNP, gross national product. And that may be difficult for you to understand. It's difficult for me to understand because domestic and national, I, I don't know if you, if you check it in the dictionary, you may end up even with, a, with the same term, with the same meaning. It both refers to the nation, to, to the nation. Domestic, it's domestic, it's not international. National, it's domestic, but in a different understanding. As we said, in the first case, GDP, we have all and only the final products. In GNP, we have to calculate a little bit more. Look, this is with if, if you take something from the internet or something, you end always up with US or some something like this. Um, I, <coughs> It's the GDP, all final products, earned by foreigners in the country, in this case the United States, in China, wherever. They are deducted. Income earned by foreigners in the country are deducted. But what is added is the income earned by citizens of the country in another country. So if we don't look at US but at China, my income does not go into the GDP here, but the income of your friends working in Italy goes into the GDP here. My income earned here is going into the GDP of Italy. Is that clear, the difference? So it's the final products in total, products and services, and then I contribute to the GDP but I do not contribute to the GNP because I am foreigner working here. And now we bring it together and we'll leave this for the next time. What happens in a more complex situation when we actually calculate GDP?
So at some stage you will have the lecture again on the network, but